Hello, Unite. I am thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, my name is uh, Fred Moreau. I belong to the graphics product management team at uh, Unity, looking after uh, visual effects and uh, share authoring tools. I'm lucky to share the stage today with our visual effects expert, Orsan Favrel, who prior to joining Unity a couple of years ago, uh, worked on AAA games at studios like Ready at Dawn and Don't Nod. I also want to express my thanks to Ben Cloward, who couldn't make it to Unite uh, this time uh, and contributed uh, quite a lot on uh, the demo you're going to be seeing today. Uh, Orson and Ben work with our engineers and UX designers uh, to uh, improve on the, uh, on the workflows. Uh, and they also contribute quite a lot to the community by sharing learning material and uh, sample content, some of which we're going to be looking at today. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, visual effects and shaders and post-processing and materials. And we're going to pick it up from where David, uh, Maxim, and Remy left it up this morning, uh, where they added the uh, uh, time of day to the Oasis uh, scene from the URP sample uh, using the new lighting scenarios. Uh, so before we uh, get into the demo, um, usual disclaimer, uh, some of the content you're going to be seeing today includes samples uh, that are not uh, available just yet. Um, so uh, it might just uh, change in the future. And before we get into the, uh, the editor, uh, we are going to take a look at uh, the end result. All right, so this is the uh, Oasis uh, scene uh, where you can see that we've added uh, rain effects to the, uh, the overall uh, project. There's a... Uh, rain on all the other uh, surfaces. We've got some post-processing to add some rain on the, uh, on the camera lens. We've added ripples on the, uh, the water. There's uh, some uh, raindrops also, uh, water puddles uh, on the terrain. We've also uh, used uh, the new capability of uh, Shadowgraph to create UI materials and UI shaders, uh, which is quite interesting to create this kind of interactive uh, interaction points uh, using uh, procedural shapes. Uh, this VFX was made with a visual effects um, graph, and Orson will show you in a moment uh, how to set it up from scratch. Like I said, uh, the, uh, the scene uses uh, time of day and lighting uh, scenarios, uh, which allows us to switch from uh, day to night. And as we get into uh, this uh, night environment, there's a, a bit of an uh, inferno uh, setup with lots of fire everywhere, and which is a very good... Uh, uh, example of uh, how we can use uh, the new profiling tools in VFX Craft to optimize uh, the VFXs. So we've got a packed agenda. So without further ado, Orson, can you show us uh, how you have added uh, the water to uh, the Oasis scene? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Fred. So at first, when we started working on this presentation, like the idea was really, you know, to have just some fun with the new Unity 6 uh, features and the sample. So I started looking into this uh, really nice uh, production already shader sample, which is full of shader graph and subgraph, and try to see some good candidates that will fit the Oasis. The first thing uh, that I found was actually uh, this pretty neat uh, underwater uh, decal caustic shader. Let me just drag and drop it over here. Yes, like so. And Unlike regular decal, like this one, uh, it's made with shader graphs, so it can be animated, and the cool thing is it can adapt uh, to any surface angle as it's featuring a pretty nice, like, uh, triple anar projection. So, and actually this is what it looks like if I'm adding this to the whole water area, like so. And this is just like the shader used as is from the shader sample directly into the scene. Now, still in the shader sample, after that, I found some cool rock shader. So originally, like the, all the rock inside the uh, Oasis project are all using the, the, the main UAP lead shader, which is very powerful and versatile. But sometimes it's, it can be better, you know, to have some custom shader that are just tailored to your needs. So I've been using this rock shader, which is featuring a very nice... Uh, a texture packing uh, system, uh, which allow me to re really reduce the memory footprint. And on top of that, there is pretty nice uh, feature that you can activate, like macro and micro details over here. And as a VFX artist, one of my favorites, uh, the rain effects, with some uh, raindrops that you can control independently and the smoothness 
were here. And this is when we started to have the idea of uh, make it rain in the, in the desert. So that's, uh, that's very nice on, a, on an instance basis, right? Uh, but usually rain is something that you want to add as a global in the overall environment. So how do you go from having the, the rain on one object to having it all on, on, the over, uh, on the whole level? So for this, as I said, I've been using this share IDs directly from the sample. It's, it's pretty well organized with subgraph for every feature. As you can see the projection, the macro details. And of course, over here is the rain uh, subgraph over here from the sample. And the only thing that I've been added here is this rain intensity property, uh, which is a local one. So when you want to control this on a larger scale, right? you need to use a global. So what I did is I just duplicated the material. Is this one over here exactly the same, but uh, I just changed the scope uh, of this uh, exposed property. So now all the rain effects are controlled thanks uh, to this global, and the rain effects are gone. Uh, I need to control this global value. For this, uh, we choose to use timeline and a global uh, value track. As you can see now, when I'm reading uh, this global value, you can see all the rain intensity that start to kick in, the puddles uh, start forming, and there's starting to yeah, have rain everywhere. So that, that's very interesting. I understand that the, uh, the this rain capability comes with the rock shitter, but what if I want to add uh, this, this rain effects or those rain effects in uh, shaders that I already have in my project. Like I remember that the, uh, the terrain and the water, for example, they're already uh, custom shaders we have in the Oasis. How did you add the rain to those? So that was pretty easy. So like the rock we use as it from the shader sample, but as you said, like the terrain were already existing. So in this case, what you can do is just take uh, directly the, the subgraph uh, like this one over here and copy paste it into your own shader. And this way you can create like your own recipes uh, uh, with this. And again, I added this global value over here. Same idea with the water actually, which uh, for those of you uh, that are not familiar with the Oasis project, this water is pretty custom and is featuring a pretty nice like screen space reflection uh, custom function. So if you want to take a look at it, don't hesitate for, your, for all your URP project. And so for, for this uh, shader, what I've been doing is just copy paste uh, this node. So it was pretty e easy like to just add some new effect on top of uh, existing shader. And now like this rain global is talking to all the surface shader basically uh, in the scene, which is pretty neat. Yep. That's very nice. Very nice indeed to, uh, to see how you can, you know, create new things by composing uh, existing Subblocks uh, that come from the uh, the sample. Um, there's just one thing. It's uh, it's missing the uh, the the clouds. It's uh, raining out of nowhere now. Uh, can you show us how you've added the uh, the clouds and the raindrops? Yeah. So in this case, I just need to activate this uh, control track over here. So I've been creating like a a simple VFS graph, which is uh, thanks to Unity six uh, reading uh, the dev buffer to collide against it. So I got some rain streak uh, splashes. And all of them are also thanks to uh, the new custom HLSL fetching the global value. So now this global value is talking to the shader and it's also talking to VFS graph basically. Uh, and it's modulating uh, the spawn rate and the opacity of uh, the, the rain streaks and splashes. Very nice. One uh, last thing, maybe uh, the, uh, the rain on lens uh, effect. Uh, yeah. Was it like uh, some custom post-processing? Yeah. So for this, uh, just in the renderer asset, you can uh, easily add new renderer feature. And in this case, just a full screen pass renderer feature. And this allow you to add you know, custom shader on top of that. And in the shader sample, there is a very cool random lenses uh, shader, actually. So let me just open this one. Uh, it's a pretty uh, basic uh, shader graph with the drips and drops that are distorting the screen UVs. And the, the only thing that I did for this demo uh, that I had to do is to add, again, this rain global to control the intensity of this uh, screen distortion over here. And now, finally, the, this global value is talking to uh, the post-process effect, the shader uh, surfaces, and all the VFX. So, yeah, 
we all often think about shader graph, uh, about you know um, making shader for the surfaces and maybe post processing. But now uh, shader graph also allow you to create actually UI shader, and I think you wanted to talk about that, right? That's right. Uh, so yes, in Unity 6, we've added the ability uh, in Shader Graph to create shaders for UI. Uh, now, this unlocks a, a wide range of possibilities, of which I want to highlight two, uh, which I think uh, are very interesting. First is the ability to process the background, which means no more just tinting uh, you know, for things like menus and, and things like that. You can uh, desaturate, you can blur the background. Uh, so that, that brings uh, uh, quite a lot and also the ability to use procedural shapes uh, instead of textures, which allows them uh, to be uh, fully resolution independent, properly anti-aliased, and uh, also uh, fully dynamic, which means that you can easily animate them, switch them, uh, and make them interactive. Uh, this is what we did for the interaction points there. Also, uh, what you see here is the, uh, the bone. Uh, oh, uh, one uh, thing I also wanted to say is that this uh, is uh, going to come with a UI tool sample that Ben is working on at the moment, uh, which is going to ship soon. Uh, it's, it comes uh, with a f over 50 subgraph nodes that you can use to create uh, dynamic procedural shapes and things like that. And it's going to come with uh, examples to make progress bars, uh, progress indicators, and lifeguards, and this, you name it. Now, when you look at the um, uh, the bonfire here. Uh, this was entirely made with a uh, visual effects graph, and we appreciate that not everyone uh, here today may know how to use VFX graph. So we want to give you a, a, a brief introduction into uh, VFX graph and how to use it. Uh, Orson, can you show us how you've made this bonfire effect with VFX graph? Yeah, with pleasure. So let's start. So unlike uh, Shuriken that you set up from the component inspector, VFX graph lets you author effect as asset on disk. So in Unity 6, we've added this new template window over here that basically allows you to kickstart your VFX creation process. And so you can start with preset and template that match your intent. In my case, I'm going to start with the smoke effect, and I'm going to start with this simple loop over here. I'm going to give you a name, like so. And from here, uh, you can either like directly drag and drop it into the scene, but in my case, I'm just going to drop it on this game object in my prefab because it's already properly positioned, right? Now I can open it like so, and let's start. Let me get rid of this. So for those of you who don't know, VFX graph features like a vertical flow with context that execute from top to bottom. Like first, like an event, a uh, spawn event is being made. Uh, that spawn particles, and then after that, they are being initialized in this context. Then they are being uh, updated every frame, and after that, they are rendered into this output context over here. This is a bit like a, a motor behavior life cycle, where you know things are you know awake, start, update, and then an extra step to control the rendering. Yeah, it's pretty much similar. And so, still like um, still like Shuriken, like. The blocks inside the context are responsible, like either for the motion or the visual aspect of your particles, right? And you can like temporarily like disable them, like so, or just uh, unlike sure you can actually you can just uh, dis uh, just remove them totally uh, so that you don't clutter your like uh, your interface, right? If you don't need them. So uh, when I start uh, working on a VFX, usually I like to focus first on the emission source. So this block over here allow me to set my particle's position either on the surface or within its volume. And in Unity 6, we've merged all the different uh, shape uh, into one block so that it's really easy you know, to, to switch uh, between the different shape, like so. Once you find the shape that you like, like you can directly like tweak it uh, in the view, like so, so that it's pretty easy and intuitive. And now that this is done, I can focus on the initial velocity thanks to this block. This block allows me to set the initial velocity like thanks to a direction, like so, right? And after that, I can just uh, tweak the, the speed uh, with these uh, parameters here. So uh, let's move on. I think we got way too many particles over here for just smoke effect, so I'm going to reduce the spawn rate. And after this, I'm just like 
uh, increasing over here uh, the lifetime of my particle. Just to give you know, like the, the smoke particle, like more room to raise and dissipate. So here uh, they are raising fast and slowly decelerating, like as the smoke is cooling down. I like it, but like it doesn't look like smoke at all, right? So <laughs> let me change the texture over here. Uh, I've got one here. Uh, and actually, as you can see here, this texture is a flipbook. So I need to change the UV mode to flipbook. It's all inside the uh, output uh, settings right here. Now I can just change uh, the flipbook size setting so that it match our texture. And while it's working, like we cannot see much as I need to update the size of our particle. And for this, I'm going to use the blackboard over here which has been like uh, totally revamped and improved so that you can manage all of your particle attributes directly with it. Can you tell us uh, what a particle attribute is? Sure. So uh, all attributes uh, have a set of built-in attributes that you can see here, and you can create custom attributes. So there is like uh, the position, the, the angle, the, the direction, I don't know, and size. And all of the, those uh, attributes are used by VFS Graph to modulate either the behavior of your particle or the visual aspect, right? Uh, so blocks over here uh, in those contexts either read or write those attribute value. And you can see this uh, relation uh, between the attributes and the blocks uh, with the highlight that is happening here when I mouse over. So it's going both way, and this way you can know like uh, uh, what uh, attributes are used uh, by the blocks and uh, with the uh, and vice versa, basically. Um, so let me see, find the size over here. Uh, and you can also just drag and drop it uh, to set your value like so. So now I'm able to set the value, pretty easy and responsive. And most of the settings are either directly in the block, but for the advanced settings, you can find them in the inspector. One of them being this random uh, option here. So here, I'm just going to add some variation uh, to my smoke. Oops, sorry, like so. And this value, uh, so the block executes, sorry, from top to bottom, right? So first I'm setting the size value, and then here you can see that it's being multiplied by this curve over the lifetime of my particle, right? So it's okay, but we can see that there is clearly a repetitive pattern over here, like so. To get rid of it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some initial rotation. For this, yeah, uh, I need to use the angle attributes, like so. So this is what I'm doing. I'm only going to do some rotation on the V axis. And again, I'm going to randomize this to 0 and 360 degree, like so. So now we're having some initial rotation. And let's add also some spinning, right? Uh, with this angular velocity, also on the z-axis with some randomization, maybe. Uh, it's nice to see that you can randomize pretty much everything yep. uh, on either a per system or per particle basis. Yep. So it's starting to be a little bit better, but we need some internal motion. So let's animate our texture. So for this, uh, I can find the different block also by searching uh, with the node search here by pressing the spacebar. So you can either browse through uh, the blocks library or search for it. And actually, uh, you can also use synonym if you're not used with VFS Graph Glossary. So in my case, I can maybe if I'm typing Sprite, it's going to find for me the flipbook player. And I can change the spawn rate, and maybe I can enable like frame blending over here. All right, so it's definitely better, but we need to do some tweaking for the with the alpha, right? Because like the, there is some popping. So I want to smoothly fade in and out the alpha. So for it, it's pretty easy. Uh, I'm going to use the node search again. And this time, I'm just going to type for it alpha over. And I want to multiply the alpha over life like this. Now I have a curve, so I can easily take one of my profile and just make some changes like this. And now. I've got smoke that is smoothly fitted in and out, which is nice. Uh, but let's tweak it so that it's a little bit more subtle. So I'm going to, again, add some randomization on the alpha. Like, 
maybe this no. visible yeah okay and also the color maybe we can darken this a bit okay so it's shaping up uh, quite nicely but I think the motion is quite uh, static right it's just going into the up direction um, so let me introduce to you to some horizontal flow logic because you're not tied to the built-in block logic and in VFX Graph you can create your own logic. And for this, I'm going to use uh, some operators. So I can add a direction like this, so still an up direction. Thanks to the new shortcuts, I'm going to add quickly some uh, noise actually to this um, to this uh, up vector, like so. Let me just do this quickly. And maybe I can change the amplitudes. And actually, I don't want to deviate on all axes. Just want to deviate on the X and Z. So in VFX Graph, you can just unwrap those vector and just plug uh, what you need. And I love let that, that you, uh, you don't have to use uh, any swizzling nodes or something to uh, just uh, remap the axes. Yeah, it's pretty useful. So here I'm just uh, getting the time, uh, not add actually, I want to multiply, sorry, uh, the time to, so that I can control the speed. And this will allow me to uh, sample uh, the skull noise over here so that we get some kind of animated deviation to mimic some kind of turbulences. That's maybe. very nice. So now maybe I can just tidy the thing a bit like so, uh, give it a name. Oh, and yeah, better. All right, so. Now, yeah. since we, uh, we know that uh, this uh, scene works in day and night, like, uh, is this effect going to work the same way if you switch to nighttime? No, it, it won't work. <laughs> uh -huh. Just let me put that to night. So, uh, no, it's a non shader at the moment, so you can clearly see that it's not grounded at all. Uh, so for this, we need to switch to a lead shader, uh, which is pretty easy to do actually, and you don't lose your modification or your behavior. What I need to do is just right click, convert my output, and find a lead shader. By default, we provide some lead shader for you, uh, like this one, the URP lead quad. So now I need to wait for the compile. And while we add it, uh, what we can do is just switch to the six-way smoke lead shader that has been introduced uh, with Unity 6, actually, uh, for URP project. Uh, a six-way smoke lead shader allows you to get very nice volumetric effects thanks to like a light map texture. And the cool thing is uh, that it can uh, take into account any number of lights, and you can take uh, the contribution of both like uh, direct and indirect lighting. Uh, and of course, it's working with the uh, APV. Uh, so this is better, uh, it's, yeah, I got a pretty nice volumetric feeling, but maybe it's not too subtle, so let me just adjust a bit uh, the alpha, because it's just a, you know, just, just a fire camp, right? It's not like burning all fire. Or, this, is, uh, this is super nice. Now, um, like in the original, this is just the smoke, but in the uh, original uh, demo, we saw that there was also fire and embers, where those um, like other visual effects that you've added, or is it all part of the same graph? What, sorry? Is it all part of the same graph when you add the fire and the embers, or um, how did you set it up? Uh, I set it up uh, by adding some um, directly in the, uh, new system into the graph. But, so to add some stuff, that the power of VFX graph is it's just allowing you to add multiple systems into your graph, right? So this is what I'm going to do uh, right away. And so for this, I'm clicking the plus button and I'm back to this template window. And you can see here that I've created like a uh, custom template. And custom template is really cool because uh, you can create your own library of VFX. And this way you can also enforce technical guidelines for your VFX artists, but also like art direction. So here I'm going to add this fire uh, template and these sparks templates, like so. And this uh, by then being into the, the same graph, this allows me to take my logic over here uh, that we made just earlier, and you can easily uh, just reuse it. So now if I'm compiling, 
I can have some fire and sparks that are all going into the same direction as my smoke, which is pretty nice. That's a, that's a very amazing fire. It almost looks like it's not uh, made of uh, particles. Uh, now, I, I see that it's got some custom, very specific inputs. Uh, what kind of uh, particle output is this? Uh, it's just a, a shadow graph output. So VFX graph and shadow graph have really great synergy be, between the two. So here, if I'm opening uh, the shader graph uh, in here, like you can see like the fire has been made procedurally thanks to uh, a sphere mass, for example, that is being distorted with some animated noise. It's pretty classic. And there is also some animated erosion pattern over here. The cool thing is like everything is controlled thanks to properties, right? And those uh, properties are exposed and you can find them and control them actually directly into VFX graph. So this means that I can control all of my uh, uh, shader property directly uh, on a per pack per particle level directly into VFX graph. So I can randomize uh, the uh, distortion strengths, I can animate the, er uh, the erosion, and so on and so on. That's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a very good example of the collaboration between Shadow Graph and VFX Graph. Now that you mentioned exposed properties, do you also have the ability in VFX Graph to expose properties so that we could control, for example, I don't know, the, the color of this bonfire? on a per instance level? Yeah, it's totally possible. So for this, uh, what you can do is just back to the blackboard again, property plus, uh, and you have all your property here. So I can create a new color, for example, and from here I can take like an orangey color. And from here you just need to drag and drop it. Uh, where you need them, so here in my case, to set the fire color and the sparks color, like so. And now, if it's working after compiling, I should be able like, to uh, just duplicate uh, my prefab here and just take uh, the fire over here and change the color of my fire. And actually, so it, it's working-ish uh, with the fire and sparks, right? But in a real world scenario, like uh, you want to also change the color of your light and the color of your material. So in this case, this burning logs, as you can see over here. So for this, like usually what you want to do is to create a mono behavior that is going to be driving your exposed properties and the rest. So this is what we've been doing here. It's a simple mono behavior and that in here, now I can just uh, change the color and it's going to update the, color, the light color, fire and all the, all the rest. So now I can make a lot of different instances and have some variation on each of them, which is pretty powerful, actually. This is a, a very good example of uh, you know how you can make the life of level designers uh, a lot better by providing them you know with like assets that they can control uh, easily. Um, this is actually something that uh, I wanted to uh, to touch on uh, also. Yeah. Um, so. When it comes to um, you know deal with interactive materials that you can uh, easily interact with, uh, the first thing um, that you might not have seen, but uh, you know with all the smoke and fire around it, but Orson's also made a custom shadow graph for the uh, the burning logs, uh, you know which also have like you know some states they're you know unburned, then they're burning, and then eventually they're they've burned. Um, so. The first thing is that when you want to create a material that is very similar to a lit shader, um, as part of the uh, production ready shader samples that Orson's mentioned earlier, we also now have templates for the lit and unlit uh, for the lit material for the URP and HDRP, which allows you to take this graph as a template and add the features you want or remove the ones you don't. Uh, it comes with all the optimizations that are made inside of those uh, uh, materials with the, uh, the different keywords and it even uh, works uh, with the, uh, the default inspector, uh, which makes it uh, a, a lot easier when it comes to uh, um, uh, customize this. Um, it's good practice, I think, to uh, actually use some you know, custom uh, inspector to drive properties like you know, vectors and things like that. It's uh, not something that you want to uh, manually uh, edit in the material. So, uh, very easy to customize the inspector to uh, to make it uh, you know a bit easier, 
And the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, on, on Shadow Graph is that we've recently added uh, a new color mode, which is called heat map, and allows you to see the relative cost of the different nodes inside of the graph. So while it's not a real in-depth profiling tool, it, it still gives you a pretty good idea of where the cost is going inside of your graph and allows you to see, for example, when you do a power of you know a power of two, then you can easily re replace that with a multiply by itself or something like that. So this allows you to make some uh, simple optimizations. Now uh, in VFX graph, we've added in Unity six a real profiling uh, tool, which allows you to uh, to make some real uh, um, uh, improvements. And Orson is going to take you through uh, the the process. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, when it comes to perform, whoops, not this one, sorry. This one? Yes. All right, so when it comes to performances, like usually like uh, performance capture and profiling analysis are king, right? But often they can be quite technical and artists are reluctant to do it or they can happen too late in production. So for this, uh, this is why we added this uh, new profiler directly embedded into VFX Graph, which uh, is live, real time, and I think pretty easy to use for, for the artist. So here, uh, let me activate this. Uh, I've added uh, some, yeah, some mood over here with a lot of VFX all around uh, that have been duplicated. So it's, it's kind of intensive on the GPU and we really need to optimize those VFX, right? So let's do that with the profiler, right? You can open it uh, with the toolbar over here and the first thing that you can notice is this um, overview panel that give you pretty nice information uh, on, of your entire graph, like the CPU timing, GPU timing, your GPU memory, and also the texture usage of your entire graph. Now, to get more uh, detailed information, what you can do is just zoom in on uh, one of your systems, for example, the scene smoke uh, over here. And uh, you can have some pretty good information, like first, like, is your effect is playing or is it uh, in pause mode, for example, and another one which is the visible curling state. So now, if I'm turning, I can see that the effect is never being curled actually. So this informs me that something is it must be wrong with my bounds. And if I'm select the init, I can see that my bounds are way too huge. So I can just make some adjustments like so. Actually, you can do that, but you can also make them directly in the, the viewport. And now uh, I should see something different. When I'm turning my camera away, you can see that the effect is properly curled, right? So we're starting to optimize this VFX, which is uh, always good. Uh, the next thing that I think is uh, interesting with this profiler uh, here is the GPU memory, which stands at 4.2 megabytes, which is just for one VFX, actually, yeah, pretty, 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 pretty heavy, actually. And the, the GPU memory is the result of the number of uh, attributes that you are storing uh, on each particle and uh, the allocation that you are making over here, right? So let's start by optimizing the, the attribute layout. So you need to, to know that uh, when you set your attribute, either in the init context or in the update context, they are being stored uh, on the particle, which take memory. but you can also set your particle attributes uh, in the output around here. And when you do so, like they are not stored and can be directly accessed. So you can free some memory. Um, so when I select this output context, uh, I can see in the inspector the attribute layout. You can see here that the position, velocity, all of those attributes are being stored. One of them being this color attribute, which is a good candidate to be put into the output. So I can just drag and drop it over here. And now, if I'm refreshing, I'm now down to 3.4, which is, yeah, way better. Now, I can do the same for those guys here. We, you may remember those uh, angular and angle attributes, but those are variadic attributes. So this means that I can just only store those attributes as floats, like so. Um, let me put them back to where they were, actually. What's nice about this is that you see that VFX graph indeed gives you, you know, the, the capability of spawning like, you know, millions of particles on the GPU, but it doesn't mean that this is what you want to do in the end. So what's nice is that you have the ability to 
work uh, with lots of particles and then eventually just optimize your systems. So here we've done 3.1, it's better, but the major culprit here is of course this allocation over here, which is way too huge comparing to the number of alive particles. So I'm just gonna reduce this 20 to give some room if I want to increase later on. Compile and now, yeah, we're now down to 1.2 kilobytes, which is what you're looking for usually, like depending on the number of particles that you have. And finally, the ne next information about this profiler uh, that I wanted to share is uh, relative to the output context. So here you can see like the millisecond, like uh, here, but if you're opening this, actually, can have some other information like the dispatch that are being made. And here I can see that a dispatch is being made uh, to sort my particle. And on this system, which is uh, the very thin smoke, like actually I don't need sorting at all. So uh, thanks to this, I'm aware that it was enabled. And in the inspector, I just can put it off and save some uh, dispatch over here. And this is how you would work like uh, in real time, like uh, you create your VFX and on the go, like on some regular basis, you, you just can make informed decision with your VFX and uh, optimize it uh, before it's too late in production. That's really uh, what we want to do. Uh, you know, we want to empower uh, tech artists and VFX artists with the ability to optimize their systems on their own without having you know, to rely on an engineer. Uh, now, um, one thing that caught my attention as you were doing this is that I see that all the, the smoke and fire effects are going in the same direction, and I was wondering if you were using some kind of a wind global direction as you did with the, uh, the rain, or is this just out of luck? Uh, yes, so VFX Web doesn't have like a global property per se, so yes, I'm using a global here uh, thanks to this wind zone, and uh, I'm using custom HLSL over here, so uh, it's a very basic code that just a bunch of declaration of vectors and floats that tell me here to fetch uh, this wind direction here or here. Very nice. And is this uh, wind direction some kind of built-in global? Uh, no, actually. So here, as you can see, I'm having a simple mono behavior that takes the wind on parameters and uh, write them to the global. And so you mentioned shader globals. That means that these are the same shader globals that you use in shader graphs? Yeah, exactly. So here, actually, this uh, wind zone, uh, as you can see, is referencing this wind global uh, HLSL file over here. And it's the same code that is driving the particle motion that the one that is driving the vegetation uh, and moving the vertices of the palm tree and the ferns uh, over here. Same. Hmm. But Shadow Graph already has some built-in Shadow Global properties, right? So why would you want to use this instead of, you know, uh, just using a, uh, why do you want to yeah. use a custom function node? Well, you could use, uh, yeah, a, a regular globals as we did for the REN effect, but uh, using a custom uh, function allow you to nest it in, inside a subgraph, uh, which is what we did here. And this is pretty powerful because this allow you to reuse it in a lot of different shaders. And this way, you don't have to worry about your global name and this kind of stuff. Uh, it's going to be taking the output. This way, you can make updates to your subgraph, and it's going to be propagated everywhere. It's a good workflow. The custom HLSL is uh, really uh, like a, a very interesting feature when it comes to stitch together shader graph and VFX graph to fit them with the same uh, values. Now, that means that you can use, reuse this like anywhere. Does that mean that you can uh, add the, the wind direction to the bonfire that you created earlier? Try. All right. So uh, I need to open uh, the fire camp again. And if you follow me, I, you may recognize this main di direction that we made earlier. So the only thing that we need to do is to create a new operator, a custom HLSL. And in this case, as I said, just need to reference this uh, win globals over here. Same using shadow graph and the previous one. And I'm just adding this to my uh, small logic over here and after compilation, yes, the fire camp is now moving in the same wind direction. So now this wind zone allow me to, uh, in real time, control like the direction of the wind and I can update all my VFX and the vegetation shaders and the ember and sparks that are flying around, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. 
uh, one word on the uh, shadow globals and uh, the things that you saw uh, Arsene use uh, earlier today. Uh, these use timeline extensions, for example, to control uh, global uh, colors, global floats, and uh, global keywords and things like that. Uh, it's all part of a, a, a custom package that is available on, the, on my GitHub. Uh, there's a QR code to uh, get the link to it. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to get some feedback on it. Uh, now, enough uh, with the uh, self-promotion. Uh, we're going to uh, show you now a breakdown of a hero VFX sequence that Orson's put together uh, between um, uh, VFX graph, shadow graph, different features, and uh, timeline. Uh, so uh, cool. do yeah. here's the uh, first. Uh, here's the, uh, the final result uh, of, the, of this uh, hero VFX sequence. You can see that it uses um, uh, a lot of the new features that we have in Unity 6, including the ability to um, uh, uh, spawn uh, decal particles, uh, to use the, uh, the depth buffer uh, as well. These uh, are features that we've uh, added to URP, um, also in Unity 6. Right. All right, more sounds. <laughs> All right, thank you. So uh, let's try to break down this uh, uh, sequence. Uh, so yeah, we really wanted to uh, showcase uh, a nice uh, uh, VFX AV sequence that uh, uh, uses the different tools. Uh, so in this case, it's using VFX graph, uh, shadow graph, and also timeline all together. And as you can see, actually, uh, in my inspector over here, uh, it's all one big prefab, and everything is embedded into it, which is so it's a self contained sequ sequence, which is pretty uh, handy. And uh, at the root, there is this master timeline over here that, as you can see, allows me to control all of my different elements over here. So, and one of uh, those main elements, the main element actually, I would say, is this. Uh, oops, no, this is not what I wanted to do. It was this one, sorry. Uh, is this uh, animated skin mesh over here, right? And as you can see, uh, this, okay, this animated skin mesh. And at the core, it's just a fracture mesh with some rigid body simulation applied on top of it. And I, something that I really enjoy with Timeline is the fact that you can take animation from your DCC and add some layer, additive layer of motion and interest directly uh, into Timeline. So here I've been adding uh, all of those rotation and position offset have been added directly thanks to Timeline, which give me a lot of control, artistic control directly inside Unity, which is good. Uh, the next thing uh, in this uh, that I wanted to show uh, is this uh, sand gliding effect over here. So to do this, uh, I've added just a few decals, one of them being a custom shadow graph decal, actually. Uh, and it's just a regular, you know, like a scrolling texture, but with polar UV coordinate. And this giving this nice sand gliding effect over here. Now, you can see that the, the intersection with the ground is, uh, yeah, meh. So for this, uh, I, I'm, I just added these uh, meshes over here. And again, if I'm opening this, uh, the scale and the, the shader actually is driven and I can control them directly into timeline, which is pretty cool. And uh, this is using a custom shadow graph uh, again uh, to deform the vertices and create this wave effect uh, as the artifact is raising uh, from the ground, like so. Uh, but of course, uh, it's not just about meshes and timeline, and it's about uh, VFX graph, right? And for this, uh, the VFX was split into uh, three different uh, VFX. Uh, there is this intro with the sand blowing, after that, there is this main effect uh, uh, with this swirling motion. Maybe it's better in game view, I don't know. And finally, this the dissolving, uh, it's dissolving into dust. And as for the rest, like VFX graph, as you can see, can be controlled thanks to like uh, VFX control track. You can send events directly here, and you can control all of your exposed property, which again give a lot of artistic control directly into timeline, like so. So let's. Uh, jump into this intro VFX uh, run here. So usually uh, when you want to create like a grounded effect, like believable effect, like one of the keys to create like 
uh, effect and particles that interact or mimic the interaction with the environment, right? And for this, like uh, one of the cool things in Unity 6 is uh, two new features has been added for VFX graph is uh, particle decals and also uh, the access to the depth buffer and color buffer. So here, uh, if I play, maybe without the, those icons, you can see that we have those nice particle decals that really help to sell this uh, impression of the um, wind blowing on the sand. So this is without, this is with, wait, play again. So this is without decals, this is with the decals. And so they are just like regi regular uh, URP decals, right? You can affect the base color, smoothness, uh, normal, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but on top of that, you have all of VFS graphs like uh, simulation capabilities. And altogether, it's very great combo like to create this uh, interaction between your particle and the environment or to give the impression that they are uh, interacting. Uh, another uh, feature is uh, the, the depth buffer access, as I said. And here, uh, you can see this collision to depth buffer block. And all of my particle, actually, over here, uh, the, the small sand pebbles and everything, they are all interacting with the, the depth, right? They're colliding with it. So in Unity 6, uh, actually, um, all the, the collision blocks, uh, as you can see, the collision side needs some field, all of them, they have received a lot of love, actually, in both stability and accuracy. And also new features, uh, which is cool. Uh, one of my favorite, actually, is this uh, trigger event here that allow you to spawn new particles uh, upon collision. And uh, another one, which I think is even better, is the fact that you can now access the collision data. So, and they are stored inside particle attributes, uh, if you want. So here you can see that I can access uh, easily the collision event count, the collision event normal, position, and the event boolean. So how is it used? So here, upon collision, for if I'm taking here this example, there is thousands of particles uh, falling on the ground, and upon collision, I'm triggering new particle over here. This is this uh, the dust cloud. I don't know if it's visible here. Maybe I can tint it a bit. Uh, here, and I don't want to spawn like a dust cloud for every small particles, right? Because there will be a nightmare on performances. So for this, I can use the activation port over here, and based on some logic, right, I can activate or not this trigger event. And here, I'm using this logic, which is using the new collision attributes. And basically, I'm checking if it's my first collision. If so, uh, okay, activate it. And based on this and some rundown, I can control uh, the number of um, a trigger event that has been made. But you can also use these collision attributes to be more fancy and maybe like uh, modulate the visual appearance of your particles. And here I'm using, again, the collision event counts to modulate the size of my particle. So they are stretched first to give a better motion impression, uh, which is always helpful. And when they are colliding, uh, they're getting back to their rounded shape as I'm deactivating this block, uh, like so. Pretty, pretty useful, and uh, also the child system can inherit uh, those collision attributes from their parents, which here is uh, useful for me to position my particles, but also to orient them. So I'm using the normal of the, the collision and uh, the position here. So yeah, this is what I wanted to say about uh, these two new features, uh, decals and uh, the access to dev buffer, that really allow you to create grounded effect, basically. And now let me switch uh, to the other one, uh, the main loop over here, which is featuring like a pretty intriguing uh, motion with particles that are swirling around like uh, the artifact shape, uh, thanks to like a, a real-time SDF. And let me just open it over here. So yeah, a part of uh, what makes this VFX interesting to me is this motion. And this has been created thanks to custom HLSL and thanks to this block, actually, over here. Um, so custom HLSL in Unity 6 really allow you to create very advanced uh, stuff, like per-particle collision or neighbor search. But to be honest, like, it will be pretty hard for me to uh, break down or demonstrate uh, this here with the time frame that we have. So I just wanted to make a, a gentle introduction to uh, custom HLCL in VFX graph, 
uh, but still uh, using this idea of a vortex force, right? But instead of doing that uh, with this uh, complex shape, we're going to do that with a, a simple vortex center and see how we can use custom HSL for this. All right, so here I should have this vortex explanation. Let's take a step back first and do some theory, right? So this is a VFX graph, and first, what we want to do, right, is to get the center, like the vortex center, which is represented by this red ball over here. And we have all particles, and we want a vector that points toward the center. So for this, we're just going to have our center position, and we're going to subtract our particle position. This should give us this vector. From here, we're going to take second ingredient and up vector. And by doing the cross product uh, between the two, we should get uh, an orthogonal vector, which is going to be the side vector. And this is what we want for creating a vortex, right? And uh, we're just going to use this and modulate our particle's velocity. So this is the theory. And let's try to do that now with this one over here. Yes, let me just drink a bit. So we got a particle that's swirling thanks to these turbulent forces oh, and, <laughs> and turbulent forces and they are colliding with the ground. Now, this is the custom HL cell over here. And as you can see, I can directly edit it. So there is your function name, your block name, and I can type code directly here. So here, if I want to create an input, I just type in uh, the type. So in my case, float three, we're going to get the center and the name of my input. By doing this, uh, an input is automatically, automatically created for me. And in my case, I'm going to use the pivot position right here uh, of our vortex, uh, like so. Now, it's not very practical to do all of this here, so I'm going to reference a file so that I can edit this into uh, my favorite IDE. And, yeah, missing time. Wow. And this is the code over here, so sorry, I'm, I'm going to go fast. So uh, first, what we want is the toward vector, uh, which is this one. And to get an attribute position, what you need to do is just attribute and the name of your attribute. So in my case, uh, position. All right, uh, next, uh, we want uh, to test our vector. So I'm going to create two new inputs, a strength and a delta time. And those are going to be used here by multiplying them together. And we're going to add those uh, to our velocity. So now, if I'm saving, and if I didn't make any typo, I get my delta time. I, get, I can add this into here, like so. And if I'm changing this, it's working. I can attract my particle. I can repeal them, uh, like so. And normally, if it's working, yeah, it's working in world space, which is good. Now, let's move on. Uh, the next thing is the side, as you can see here. So I can take the side and replace or toward over here. And it's the cross product between the toward center and an up vector. And in my case, I'm going to use the collision even normal. So I can start to tie, but I'm going to make some error. So instead of that, what you can do uh, in VFS graph is just grab your attribute over here and just copy name and paste it over here. So this should work. And after that, I want to uh, modulate uh, uh, this thanks to a distance uh, to the center. So this is what it's doing. I'm declaring a distance, and I'm using this distance function. But I want to control this distance value, so I'm going to do a remap. And the remap is, isn't present in HLSL, pure HLSL. So for this, as we see sharp, you can incul include your own library of HLSL, which is what I'm doing here with this over here. And finally, I'm going to visualize this uh, in into my color, and I'm going to sample a curve to give me some more artistic control. So here, I'm creating the curve inputs, and here I'm sampling the curve to modulate our distance. And again, if I didn't make any typo, it should work. And now I got a curve that I can invert, and I'm able to control my vortex. So this is uh, how you would uh, use like custom HLSL like, uh, to, uh, 
to create your own effect. And as you can see, if we're getting back to this previous effect uh, around here, the ID is really the same, just simpler. But we have a remap. Uh, I'm remapping the position to 0, 1. And instead of getting the normal of the terrain, I'm getting the normal from SDF, uh, right, to get the up vector. And instead of using just a regular center, I'm using the closest uh, position on my SDF shape. And this is what is giving me this kind of scrolling motion that we have here. And as you can see here, you, you could ask yourself, where are the coming those functions, right? So uh, you could create uh, your own uh, function, as we saw. And there is some functions that are available and macro that are available to you. Some of them are directly uh, can be seen inside the documentation of VFX graph uh, into uh, the HLSL part. But some of them are more hidden into this VFX command.hlsl file, which is inside the VFX graph package. And there is a lot of uh, custom functions that you can directly use without any includes. And uh, they are really useful. And actually, that, they are the ones that I use uh, for the blocks. Because here, if I'm uh, looking at the blocks, actually, uh, there is a VFX preference somewhere. <laughs> that we need to show, show additional debug info. If I'm doing this, you can see the computed source code of the block, which is pure HLSL. So if you want to learn about HLSL and try to use that, you just take a look at the different block, and you should see some great HLSL that are using the, the function that I show you. And I think we in hurry. And this is the end for this uh, presentation. This is super impressive. Uh, what I like about this is that uh, you can see that, um, you know, obviously some of the things that we saw, uh, you know, using custom HLSL there does not require custom HLSL, but it means that you can use VFX graph. It turns VFX graph into some kind of a, you know, a, a compute shader sandbox where you can go and find lots of references on the, on the, on the web to, uh, uh, um, you know, just Put them in there and, and, and experiment without having to, uh, you know, do all the boilerplate of uh, uh, compute shaders. Uh, now let's uh, recap on uh, what uh, we saw today uh, very quickly. We uh, saw that uh, we we share lots of samples. Uh, some of them, you know, to learn, uh, help you, uh, you know, learn and better understand what we do. Uh, some samples uh, allow you to uh, just work with uh, things like they, they'll just you know you can copy paste them and, and branch them uh, to uh, to work in your productions. The uh, the templates is also uh, something that um, uh, we've introduced in VFX Graph and somehow also in Shadow Graph, allowing you to create new content uh, uh, very quickly. We've improved the UX uh, in UN86 uh, across the board between Shadow Graph and VFX Graph. Uh, we want to also give you all the tools that you need to assess the performances of the assets because you know we all want to create amazing effects, but at the end of the day, it's got to fit you know in the uh, in the budget. Uh, we brought URP in VFX Graph. We brought URP up to par with HDRP, which means that all of the features that we used to have in HDRP, such as decals and smoke lighting and all of that, are now also available to you when you use URP. We also introduced new features, uh, such as the, uh, the new collision events and, uh, uh, and uh, collision uh, attributes. Um, and last, uh, like I said, uh, custom HLSL. Uh, this allows you to stitch together um, uh, Shadow Graph and uh, VFX Graph. Also allows you to do things that you couldn't do with just uh, VFX Graph uh, with a graph. Things like um, you know, a uh, flock of birds and uh, things like that by doing neighbor search or some kind of you know, fluids and, and things like that. Uh, we've got a new ebook coming out on uh, VFX uh, Graph. Uh, so there's a, a QR code for you uh, that's going to take you on the landing page. It's going to come out uh, real soon. And I think that we've got a few seconds for taking a couple of questions. Uh, we can go on the side after it. No problem.